Please stand with us and sing. time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now, come, now is the time to worship, come, now is the time to give your Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, one day every knee will bow, still the greatest treasure remains for those. Choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. As you are before your God, come, come. Amen and good morning. Welcome to worship, all of you, those of you who are here, it's so wonderful to see all of you here, and those of you who are online, welcome to all of you as we join together for worship this morning on this annual meeting Sunday. And now, friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. And let us greet one another. Good morning, kiddos. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And let us gather in a moment of prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for allowing us to gather here to worship you this morning. Lord, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us in this time and in this place. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, kiddos, you ready for a children's moment? Yeah, I see the big kiddos behind me are ready for a children's moment. Okay. So kiddos, are you, have you guys ever heard an expression, you can't judge a book by its cover? Yeah, some of you have. Now I, right here, I have this. This, anybody know what this is? Do you know what this is? Any guesses? It's a Bible, I heard it over there. Is this Bible in good shape? No, if you look, I've actually, the whole entire cover came off. I had to tape this, all of this. If you look closely, it's all sealed together with tape. This Bible has been so used and so abused. It's all falling apart. The whole edges have come off. So it doesn't look like it's in very good shape. Now, do you think I would be better off with this Bible or with a brand new Bible? This Bible. Why do you think I'd be better off with this Bible than a brand new Bible? Oh, so yeah, so this one, this I've read many times and actually, so this one, the reason it's falling apart 
is because I've read it so much. The reason it's falling apart is because I've read it so much. And if you look through here, you're going to see so many different notes. There's notes in here. If we go to what the adults and I are going to read today, if we open up to this gospel, we're going to see that sometimes there's red writing and sometimes there's pencil writing and sometimes there's purple writing. There's all different colored writings because when, when I read something for a different time, I write in the notes in the Bible. So this Bible, it has so much of my years of, of experience and things that I've learned written into the notes of this Bible. So even though this Bible looks like it's kind of falling apart and there are pages that have literally fallen out, even though it looks like it's old and used, it is actually my favorite Bible ever. So the expression, you can't judge a book by its cover. It's a pretty good expression. We also have this children's book at home that I meant to bring in, but I totally forgot. We have this children's book at home that's called The Snail and the Whale. I think that's the title of it, but you can't actually see the title of it because the cover got chewed by one of our dogs when they were a puppy. (laughs) And so the cover has been torn all apart, but the book is amazing. And the first couple of lines of the book, it's a good thing that I actually have it memorized from when my kids were little because we would read it so frequently because you actually can't read the first couple sentences because of the dogs, but it is such a good book. So I want us to think about that expression. You can't judge a book by its cover. Now let's think about people. Can we judge people just by what we see from the outside? No. We have to get to know them, don't we? Ooh, we've got some feedback right here. Hold on one second. I'm going to see if I mute this, if it might be better. Okay. Oh, I think that is better. We have to get to know people. So the same way that we can't judge a book by its cover, we have to get to know people. We can't judge people by their outside. And Jesus talks about that in what us adults are going to read. We can't just look at somebody and decide whether or not we like them by what we see. We actually have to get to know who they really are. And that's what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to get to know everybody as they really are. So I want you guys to think about that today because us adults are going to talk about that, but you're also going to learn something new in Sunday school. So why don't we stand up and say a prayer, and you can go off to Sunday school. (laughs) Here we go. And let us gather together. Want to hold my hand? There we go. And let's pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you and we praise you for gathering us here. And Lord, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Bless us and bless these children. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And you can go off to Sunday school. Go, my children, with my blessing ever alone. Waking, sleeping, I am with you. You are my own. In my love's baptismal river, I have made you mine forever. Go, my children, with my blessing, you are my own. All right, and now it's time for announcements. So if you have an announcement, you can come forward at this time. I do have a few announcements for you, but uh, there's the first one is a very sad one. At, but it, however, she was 94 years old. She lived a good long life, but B. Hicks has returned home to the kingdom of God, where she is now with her husband, Jerry, again. And so we have lost B. Hicks, but we know that she is now in the kingdom of God. And so we rejoice with her knowing that. Uh, many of you who have been here for a long time probably remember B. She used to play in the bell choir. Her husband, Jerry, had this big booming voice as he sang in the choir. It was beautiful and wonderful. And so uh, the service for B. Hicks is going to be on Tuesday at 9 a.m. here in the sanctuary. I also do want to make sure everybody knows that as we've been praying for Rob Voss uh, for a while, and those of you who are on the prayer chain might know a little bit more than those who are not, I do want everybody to know that Rob Voss is now officially within hospice care. And so I know Rob always watches us every morning for Sunday morning, and so does Sandy. So I thought it would be really nice and sweet if we all turn around right now and look at the camera and say a good, good morning to Sandy and Rob. Good morning. 
We love you both, and we just hope that, that you are surrounded by God's presence during this time. We also have so much, and we don't usually do this, but we have so much going on in the life, in the, like the, the life of all of our church members, so much pain. I did just learn that, that George, uh, George, will you raise your hand for a second, that George's son had a stroke and a possible brain aneurysm, and they're looking into things like that. So George, we're holding you in prayer, and we're holding your son in prayer. And uh, then we also have Odie Johansson, who's always with us, who, who she's been going through a lot. And we have Mary Mueller, who was in the hospital, and Dick Atfell, who was in the hospital. We have so much with all of our people. There's been so much pain people have been carrying and, uh, and a lot of health issues. So I just ask that we hold each other in prayer because we really need to pray for one another. Let us hold each other in prayer at all times because that's how we lift each other up. And that is my announcements for today. Now we have some others. Good morning. Good morning. My children's church is um, Grace Church over on Agard. Um, they're having a clothing cl closet again. I don't know if, if I mentioned it the last time. On March 25th, they'll be giving away men's, women's, and children's clothes. They have... Um, books for children and adults, and they have accessories and shoes and purses, all free. So this would be March 25th, and if you have any questions, there's one of these cards on the back of the sanctuary, and also one in Cook Hall, and also one posted on the bulletin board on the outside. So I hope if anyone wants to or needs to, please go and avail yourself to this wonderful thing. I also have a nice announcement after we had some sad announcements, but um, I'll, Zion can honor this one member of our church that's in the military. If James Cousins would stand up, please. Whoa, James. Yes, please. James. Uh, well, then just wave your hand so everyone knows you. Okay. Um, I'll just read what was in the newspaper. Captain James Cousins from Williamsville, serving with the 10th Area Command, received the New York Pandemic Response Service Ribbon during the recent unit training events between December 2022 and February of 2023. And he deserves a hand. Uh, it's Easter flower time again. These forms are back on the ledge with a box if you want to fill it out and put the, the money in the form in there, or you can order online. I will also be here uh, before and after the meeting, so if you want to see me in person to order your flowers also. Thank you. Good morning. So Saturday is our basket raffle. Is there anybody that's as excited as I am? <laughs> Excellent. Um, I would like to extend my thanks to all of the, the all of you that came in yesterday for the basket assembly. They look wonderful. Would all of those that participated in the basket assembly please go ahead and raise your hand, please? Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Beautiful job. Um, I have two kind of final announcements in advance of the basket raffle. If you have signed up for um, the setup crew. Remember that we're going to be meeting this Friday at 6 p.m. If you have signed up to bring in your uh, crock pots, um, we ask that you come in on Saturday at 11.30 with any utensils, serving utensils. And for anyone that signed up for um, the day of the event, which is the 50-50, the, the crock pot cook-off, the Cheeses for Jesus, any of those things. Um, Cheeses for Jesus might be a little bit earlier, but um, that's also 11:30 on Saturday. So again, there's really only two times you have to remember. If you're going to be, if you signed up for Friday setup, it's 6 p.m. If you signed up for the crock pot or help the day of the event, it's 11:30 uh, a.m. We hope that we see all of you there. It's going to be a great event. Thank you. And now let us join our hearts and minds together as we pray for prayer, or pray for peace. Holy and loving God, we have so many prayers on our hearts now, so many pains and so many worries. So we lift up everything to you at this time. And Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for peace that surpasses all human understanding. We pray for peace in our lives. We pray for peace in this world. We're, we pray for peace for those who feel broken and hurt. We pray for peace for everyone. 
at all times. And we pray that one day there will be peace on earth. And until that day comes, may we, Lord, be instruments of your peace. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Good morning, Zion family. You look great out there. Will you please join me in the opening litany this morning? We gather in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. That we may share God's love and life that we may be renewed in the refreshing spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord.
Amen. My apologies over that little sanctuary snafu. I forgot to tell which musician uh, who I wanted to play that. Uh, so thankfully, they're all so wonderful. <laughs> it all worked out. And now, friends, we are going to read from the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. We're going to read the first 42 verses, which I understand is a lot of verses, but I promise you it's a really good reading. We are going to read these first 42 verses as we read this story of Jesus and the woman of Samaria. So if you are ready to hear the word of the Lord, will you please say amen? Amen. Starting with verse 1. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. I would love to know more about that story, by the way. (laughs) For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband, and what you have said is true. And the woman said to him, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say, when he says you say, he means the Jewish people. The Jewish people say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to this Samaritan woman, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. And just then his disciples came and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, cultural norms. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? And then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and they were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to, him, said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four more months and then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting 
the reaper is already receiving wages and gathering eternal fruit or fruit of eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together for here the saying holds true one sows and another reaps i sent you to reap that for which you did not labor others have labored and you have entered into their labor many samaritans from the city believed in jesus because of the woman's testimony he told me everything that i have ever done and so when the samaritans came to him they asked him to stay with them so these samaritans asked a jewish man to stay with them and he stayed with them two days and many more believers believed because of his word and they said to the woman it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of this world the word of god for the people of god thanks, thanks be to god Thank you, choir. Will you join with me in a moment of prayer? Holy and loving God, we thank you and we praise you. We thank you for allowing us to be here and to gather here as your church. We thank you for allowing us to have a safe place to worship you. We thank you for bringing us your peace. 
especially during anxious times and when the world seems like chaos. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives. And so, Lord, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Bless the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our minds, so that all that we do and all that we say can be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So as if there are not enough reasons why we can love Jesus and be excited to follow Jesus, he gives us even more reasons in our reading today. He starts by taking his disciples straight through the region of Samaria. Now, this is something that most Jewish people did not do. Now, I understand that this map is going to be hard for you to see, but that's why I picked a color-coordinated one. So if you see in that middle area, there's blue. That's the region of Samaria. If you see below, that's orange. That's the region of Judea. If you see the yellow up part, that is the region of Galilee. So we know that many of Jesus' disciples came from the region of Galilee. We also know that Jerusalem is in Judea. And so quite regularly, Jesus needed to travel from Galilee to Jerusalem and back and forth. And when many Jewish people had to do this, if they had to travel, uh, travel from Galilee to Judea or from Judea to Galilee, you know what? they would do they would go around Samaria it look how much longer it would take instead of going straight through they would go around Samaria and they would do this because the Samaritans and the Jews hated one another they had mutual disdain for one another now you might think that that's because they're from different religions maybe right mm, but not at all the same religion the same holy scriptures, the same beliefs, the same ancestors, everything between the Jewish people and the Samaritans that they believed was the same. The only difference that they had, ooh, the only difference that they had. Anybody remember what it was? The place of worship, the place that they worshiped. So, and you may have caught that in our reading too. And so the Samaritans, they thought that they were supposed to worship, and it's like almost halfway up through the blue area, in a place called Mount Gerizim. That's where they built a temple, and that's where they thought that they were supposed to worship God. And the Jewish people, they built a temple where? In Jerusalem. And that's where they believed that they were supposed to worship God. And because of this difference, this, let's quite frankly say silly difference, because of this silly difference, they hated each other. Even though by the time that Jesus is in Samaria talking to the Samaritan woman, by that time, the temple in Mount, on Mount Gerizim had been destroyed. And you know what? It wasn't going to be that many more years before the temple in Jerusalem would also be destroyed. But these people, because they disagreed on the place of worship, they hated one another. And this hatred was mutual. People who were Jewish wouldn't travel through Samaria because the Samaritans would spit on them and not... Be be hospitable to them at all. And then the Samaritans didn't want to leave their area because the Jewish people hated them and would be rude and demeaning to them. It was a terrible, very, quite frankly, stupid reason for them to hate one another. And yet their people and us people, we're not always as smart as we think we are, are we? <laughs> We can be pretty petty, too. Humans can be pretty petty. If you look throughout all history, I wonder if you looked at, like, all of the reasons for so much of the bad stuff that's happened through history. I wonder if some of it is rooted in petty differences. But humans, ah, oh, God made us with these brilliant minds, and yet sometimes we humans, we're not as brilliant as we think that we are. But Jesus, Jesus is so brilliant, and Jesus is so wonderful. I wish everybody knew just how wonderful Jesus really is. Jesus is so awesome. Do you understand how awesome Jesus is? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ooh, Dave knows how awesome Jesus is right here. Jesus, I love this. Every single time, he doesn't go around Samaria. When he's got his disciples with him, he goes straight through Samaria. Traveling north, he goes straight through Samaria. Traveling south, he goes straight through Samaria. And that's not all that he does. He also stops and has a conversation with a woman one-on-one. -on -one. If you've been here the past few Sundays, you know that that's not something that a man was supposed to do, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a woman in public. Did Jesus care about social norms? like that. Uh-uh, not at all. So Jesus, when he's going straight through Samaria at this time, he stops 
And he has a conversation that I'm pretty sure was an extremely interesting conversation that I, I want to see in that heavenly movie theater someday. But he had this super interesting conversation with this woman from Samaria. This conversation that, that at first she was uneasy about having because first she was a Samaritan and he was a Jew. So they were supposed to hate one another. That's what they were told. They were told they were supposed to hate one another. And then to add to that, she was a woman and he was a man. And so the second that Jesus starts having this conversation with this woman, the, the second that Jesus asks this woman for a drink of water, the second that this conversation begins, the woman at first is like kind of, struck in that moment being like what are you doing talking to me who am I that you would talk to me you know how is this okay that you're talking to me but then this woman and Jesus they have this conversation an interesting but I'm sure beautiful conversation and by the time that the conversation is over this woman she is on fire because that's what happens when somebody really gets to know Jesus by the way when somebody really gets to know Jesus they get on fire and so this woman she's just on fire after talking to Jesus and she believes that Jesus is the Messiah so she goes and runs and she tells everybody that she knows and and she brings them back to Jesus because she is so excited that Jesus is the Messiah and then after that happens Jesus with all of his Jewish people all of the people who are with him who are Jewish, all of his Jewish disciples. So this big group of Jews sits down and has a, a conversation and stays with this large village of Samaria. All of these Samaritans and these Jewish people, they get together. They converse. They break bread with one another. They get to truly know one another. And by the time that Jesus leaves, all of those Samaritans... They've changed their views on some of the Jewish people. And all of the disciples who are with Jesus, all of the Jewish disciples, are changing their views on these Samaritan people. They all learn that the biases that they've carried with them for so long are things that they need to put aside. And they come to have conversations with one another and to see one another and to love one another to the point that the, the Samaritans all begin to believe that Jesus truly is the Messiah. I love this reading for so many reasons. I mean, I decided to read all 42 verses for you, even though I totally could have skipped over some, because I love this reading. It's powerful. Such a powerful interaction that Jesus has as he's traveling through this area that Jews aren't supposed to go through. As a Jewish man, Jesus travels through this area and he changes hearts and he changes lives. But I love this reading for so many reasons. But one of the reasons, I'm only going to stick to one, one of the reasons that I love this reading so much is the way that Jesus challenges his disciples and the way that Jesus challenges us to drop our biases. I love the way that Jesus challenges all of us to drop our biases. The Samaritans were biased against the Jews and they hated each other because of that bias and yet Jesus challenges them to drop those biases. The Jews were biased against the Samaritans and yet Jesus challenges not just his disciples but many of the Jews. Think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. The reason Jesus used the Good Samaritan as the good person in that parable. Jesus challenges challenges the Jews to drop their biases against the Samaritans. And I love it. I love this lesson. Because we can never look at the face of another person that God doesn't love. We can never look at somebody and decide that maybe we hate them and have God hate them as well. That's not how it works. We can never look at another person who God doesn't love. I don't know who originally said that. It's not my quote, but somebody else said it. But it's true. I want us to sit with that for a moment. Because if we think about it, there are so many struggles in this world. There's so many trials in this world. And yet so many of the trials in this world come because people are biased against other people. And biases, they're unholy. Like, if we're going to think about things that are holy and things that are unholy, biases are unholy. God made everyone. God, made everyone. God loves everyone. Think about all the unconditional love. Think about all of the, the unholy biases that exist in this world. Think about people who have biases because of, of different cultures. 
different skin tones. People are biased over that. Think about biases over LGBTQ things. Think about those kind of biases. Think about biases over religion. There's so many biases over religion. Sometimes there's even people hold biases against people that are of the same religion but different denominations. <laughs> it's like, oh, we all believe in Jesus, but wait, we worship in a different way, and so they have biases that way. People have biases sometimes for the, the stupidest reasons, too. Sometimes you'll have Red Sox fans and Yankee fans that can't get along. Oh, my goodness, they're going to hate those who are on the other side. We have biases against people who vote differently from us. Maybe there's even biases over like male and female, whatever. There are so many biases in this world. And the, all of those biases, they tear people apart. They make people like look at somebody and make an immediate judgment without getting to know who they truly are. And that's unholy. That is so unholy. If I look at somebody, if I look at Sue... And I decide, oh, well, well, I, I'm not going to be friends with Sue because she is, I don't know, I can't think of anything about you, Sue, right now <laughs> that somebody wouldn't love. But, but because, because, I don't know, she's a, let's, oh, we, there we go. Thank you. High five there. Because she's left-handed. See, she even, she handed me the wrong way. <laughs> let's say, that is such a great one. Let's say that I'm going to look at Sue and I'm going to say, oh, she's a left-handed person. <clears throat> That's evil. There are actually people, I'm jo I, that sounds like a joke, but there are people who think that those are who are left-handed are evil in some way. Like, I'm not even making this thing up. Let's, I know it's terrible and stupid, isn't it? That's how every bias is. That's why I, that's, I got so many reasons for why I love Jesus, but that's just another one. That's a cherry on the top. Jesus gets us to drop our biases. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. So a little while ago, or years ago, actually, I was traveling, and I was with the, the pension board program. I have to go on another trip with them soon. But I was traveling, and I, uh, it was my job to return this van to uh, the Ford dealership. For some reason, we had this big van, and I had to return it to a Ford dealership. And then that Ford dealership was going to bring me to the airport afterwards. And so that was kind of like my task. I said it was fine. I was happy to do it. So I drove the van, this big, you know, 14 passenger van or whatever to the Ford dealership. And I'm having a conversation with the guy before I return it. And we're just chit chatting and everything. I'm sitting in his office as we're talking. And then as we're talking to one another, finally he goes to me, you know, we're having a nice conversation. And then he goes, Oh, where are you from? Or where are you traveling to? And I said, Oh, New York. I've learned, by the way, say Buffalo, not New York. But anyways, we're going to get to that part of that reason in a second. I just said New York, meaning the state of New York. Suddenly, this man goes quiet. We're in Kansas as this is happening. And suddenly, this man goes completely quiet. And his face, which had been like a warm and welcoming face, goes completely cold. Nothing about me has changed. All that I've done was answer his question. He asked where I was going, where I was flying to. I said New York. That is as much as I said in that conversation. And his face went completely cold. His demeanor completely changed. And he sat there quiet for what felt like a minute, a solid 60 seconds to me, which when you're having a conversation, conversation with somebody and they ask you a question and then they're silent for 60 seconds is super awkward by the way and so I'm sitting there as this man just goes completely cold and completely quiet and I'm just sitting there like la -dee -da, -dee da I guess he didn't like that answer and then suddenly he looks up and he goes I hate people from New York he goes people from New York City think that they know everything and I just laughed because I do that. I'm one of those laugher people, you know, so I just like do this funny, awkward laugh. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not from New York City at all. I've only been there like a couple times in my life. I'm like, actually, I, I live in Buffalo. You know, it's like a long ways away. It's right next to the Great Lakes. I was like, and by the way, I went to school way upstate New York in what we call the North Country, like way up there that's closer to Montreal than anything. And he was like, oh, oh, oh. I'm like, New York's a pretty big state. And suddenly he felt like a jerk. <laughs> Because he, in that moment, decided he wasn't going to like me because he thought I was from New York City. He, in that moment, had this huge bias, had this huge judgment because he thought that I was from New York City. 
And then I, you know, of course, I quickly stopped that, and I didn't have that conversation any longer, but I wanted to be like, really? Like, you, you really were going to hate somebody you were having a perfectly pleasant conversation with when you thought that they were from New York City. And the thing about this is that sometimes we have experiences that formulate our biases. Sometimes maybe something happens. Maybe we have an, a bad experience with somebody who's left-handed, and suddenly when we have a bad experience with somebody who's left-handed, because, you know, I said something annoying, so they slapped me over the hand with the left hand, or, or over the head with the left hand. Let's imagine. Imagine that. Sue would never slap me. But uh, imagine that she did. You know, and so suddenly I had, a, I had some reason to dislike one person who's left-handed. Whenever we, we have that create a whole entire bias in our mind where suddenly we're going to hate everybody who's left-handed, that is unholy. I actually think that basically every bias that we could probably list is unholy. Biases in themselves are unholy because when we have a, a bias like that, what we do is we put everybody into one big group. We take one person and then we group everybody together because of that. And we take all of these things and we put everybody together into one group and we stop seeing people for who God made them to be. And so what I want us to think about here, and I got to stop because we got a meeting to get to today. I love the way that Jesus challenges our biases. And the reality is that we all carry biases with us. All of us. Just the other day, I realized I was totally biased against somebody when I heard their accent. I was like, ooh, pastor check here. <laughs> yep, that pastor's giving me an eye. I see it, but he knows. <laughs> All of us, sometimes we might not even realize it, but we carry within us some biases that, that go unchecked. We carry within us some kind of biases that, that we don't check. We just let sit in us. And we let them rule our lives. But I'm just going to say that's unholy. Those unchecked biases are unholy. So as we journey through the season of Lent, as we make our way through this journey, why don't we work on checking our biases? How can we learn to love people who maybe we've been told we're supposed to hate? How, are we, how can we move to love people that maybe we've otherwise wanted to judge? How can we learn to love people that we've thought were somehow wrong or evil? I love how Jesus challenges us like that. And I told you, I caught myself with one the other day. So as we journey through the season of Lent, maybe let's slow down, which is hard for some of us to do. <laughs> let's slow down and check those unchecked biases and see if there's any work for us to do. Is there any nastiness in here that we got to dig up? That we got to root out so that we can love a little bit better? I don't know. But I'm thinking that even though I'm looking at a group of some pretty awesome loving people, I think we can do any, even better. Amen. Anybody else think we can do even better? Yes. So let's take this challenge from Jesus during the season of Lent. The Samaritans learned how to drop their biases. Maybe we can do the same. And let's join in a moment of prayer. Jesus, we turn to you on this day, thanking you for all of the lessons that you have shown us. Lord, I am so thankful for the gift of the Gospels. I am so thankful that we get to understand and to learn so much more about Jesus. I am so thankful for the way that Jesus leads us to, lead, to live better lives, more loving lives. Lord, and I just pray that you can move in our lives, that you can help us to do better and to be better so that we can follow you more closely, so that we can feel that fire within us, that that woman by the well that she felt. May we feel your presence as we journey to do better, as we journey to follow you more fully. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all of the challenges that you give us because they are good challenges. Anytime you help us to become better people, Lord, we thank you. And we ask that you work with us as we journey through this season of Lent. And Lord, we thank you for all things. And we pray this and every prayer through Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, let's continue our worship this morning with our tithes and offerings. And let us pray together. Gracious God, may this act of giving transform our hearts and our minds. May you bless these gifts and use them to do your will. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption till where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me, lead me to the cross. You were as I, tempted and tried. For my sin and death, now you're risen. And everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. to the cross, to your heart, to your heart, lead me to your heart, lead me to your heart, lead me to the cross where your love poured out, bring me to my knees. 
lead me to the cross. And now be blessed with the blessing of God, but don't go forth quite yet because we have our annual meeting. So go, stay put and be blessed and be a blessing to God.